Um, and interestingly enough, I also had contact yesterday with the great nephew of uh, Jack. So there we were, the two great nephews, <coughs> having a chat about those early days and about those interesting people. Uh, so it's going to be a bit different today. I'm going to talk about, as I say, my research uh, that led to my PhD and led to my monograph. Uh, I don't know about what that is, but I hope that might be interesting for you. Um, I've already heard from one or two people that are not much new here that you know it's a little bit of mind, you will recognize it in that case. So, um, I started off when I began thinking about this with the rather puzzled idea. You'd have thought in the late part of the 20th century that realism had won out, that we were all realists, that superstition and anything like that had vanished. So I was a little surprised that. I found authors were very interested in magic and the supernatural. Uh, not just the so-called magical realists in South America, very well known, but other authors as well. I mentioned here Kutsin and Rushdie. Of course, if you read this Telegus, as you know, that the beginning of Rushdie's novel involves two angels. And the Kritzer um, wrote an extraordinary uh, book uh, in which um, a dying woman finds uh, a trap in her garage. And she wonders, having read Tolstoy's short stories, whether he might be an angel. And as the novel progresses, it becomes clear that he does have certain angelic he becomes, in fact, an angelic guy in the second half of the novel. He's even given the name Mr. Vertigo. And of course, you'll be aware that Virgin was Dante's guide through the three areas of the comedy. Not the three, because he wasn't allowed to have the uh, inferno. Anyway. And at the end, it becomes clear that Mr. Vertigo is indeed the angel of death. So these sort of things are a bit odd. Then I was, I think I told you last time, interested in making literature a living thing. And one way that I loved to do that is in producing plays. So I had my drama group, and among the, the uh, plays that we produced, there was Priestess and Inspector Calls, you probably know it. Uh, Shakespeare's The Tempest, Marlowe's Old Pastors, and a play by the South African author, the Hugo, called Dimitris. Not very well known, but it's published by Oxford. Um, it has been neglected uh, because people never saw it as a post colonial work. It isn't about apartheid, or at least not obviously about apartheid. And everybody wanted realistic plays about apartheid, like the island. And, uh, the other political works that Hugo wrote. Now, in the Inspector Cools, you may remember, has a very strange inspector at the beginning, and then later a real inspector rings up. We'll come back to that later. The strange inspector, I saw in my production as an angel. When he calls for his coat, just before he's about to leave, it is a white fellow coming to the wings. Um, this is my, my own interpretation, of course. That's the wonderful thing about plays, as you know, plays do not exist. Very important thing to remember. Plays do not exist. There is a text on the paper, that's not a play. The play is always something new, however it is produced, and each time it is performed, it is different. Then you package it away, and it's gone. It's not there. <laughs> Here's you. The Tempest, of course, is very much about magic. Prospero's magic, and which he performs to his spirit area. Marlowe's Alchemist, this is all about magic. 
It's all about rejecting the other subjects that you can study at university and study magic instead. With which, of course, he calls out Mephistopheles, the devil representative of the Muslim world. This is a very, very interesting word, of course, if you know your Latin. Lucifer means the bearer of light, the bringer of light. Interesting. Uh, and then it does, as I said. Now, when I had done all this, I noticed that there were some themes that seemed to be in all of those plays, and were also in David Downey's novel Disappearance. So I thought, oh, I need to ask an expert. I went along to David Downey in Warwick and I said, um, that's a funny thing. All these plays, you could be talking about your bears in yours as well, your disappearance has got the same thing in it. Why? He said, I have absolutely no idea. Why don't we do a PhD and find out? So that was the beginning of what I did and what I would like to sketch rather briefly. In some ways, then, it does begin with Dr. Faustus. Dr. Faustus, in performance, these are my two actors uh, in Dr. Faustus. And both of them, originally, I had wanted the male first. I also wanted the male first. And I actually had somebody lined up, um, and then he said, oh, well, I don't want to be there. Uh, but a girl who had played Ariel and had played a little much of the Lady Divitas said, I would like to go. I thought, what? What's going on here? Now, it's, you can't find a Dr. Faustus anywhere that's not with women. But in those days, the idea of having a different gender was relatively new. So I thought, can I make sense of this? Is there any way of making sense of this? Now, I don't know if we're going to be able to see this. Just included a, a short clip here from my production. Um, in my production, I had in front of the stage seven cages. And in those seven cages were seven creatures who later turned out to be the deadly sins. And each of them, when something happens which refers to, for example, pride or anger or gluttony, or something, anything like this. They make noises. It's just like, you know, on, on a sitar, you have your synthetic strings, and if something, you, you touch a note, and the synthetic strings uh, vibrate in the... I don't know, so it's not harmony, it's the... I don't know, it's not even scary. Yeah. Never mind, you know that, you know, so that music. So there we have those, and then on the stage, the light comes up on a girl. Let's see if this is going to work.
she kind of approached. So I was about to say here we have a gender knowledge. Knowledge of the Renaissance uh, was only a woman and not a woman. Mm -hmm. So she has to become male in order to gain knowledge. And she runs through the different subjects that she can do. One of them is what she should do. Should I be a doctor? No, because a doctor can only cure diseases. He can't bring back people from the dead. Uh, a lawyer is only dealing with the compulsory matters of legacies. That won't do any good. Um, and so on. And then he comes to me, he also talks about Aristotle. And when he throws away Aristotle, he says, On Kaleo, thank you. On Kaleo, on Kaleo Greek, being or not being. To be or not to be. This was the division of the world that Aristotle made. So on things which exist, and things which do not exist. So we don't need to bother with things that do not exist, we can deal with things that do exist. And um, Pascus rejects that. Because of course magic rejects that. Magic is things which do not exist, but they do. Very strange. So um, he then decides to do magic with the help of two male figures, Cornelius and Barnes, gets all the books needed in order to conjure. Uh, this is the end of the conjuration scene where he, she, calls up when the is appears as a conventional devil, Faustus breaks out in love. Now I just I'm going to pretend that we go and return the book. This is Kid Friar. The Friar of the uh, Mandalorian, the Monk. Thank you. 
so that meant that they were never really organized. The Gnostic texts uh, at the beginning were sometimes taken up. For example, in John's Gospel, in the beginning was the word, is definitely a Gnostic text, which found its way into the conventional Bible. But most of it didn't. Most of it didn't. And the Christian Church, which by that time had become a hierarchy, with uh, a leader at the top and, and people under the leader, and a definite body of texts, which they said were the, the only ones which were important. And they also established um, a monopoly on magic, which they called miracles, being able to do miracles in the day of the which was of course magic. And um, they suppressed Gnosticism ruthlessly. Any Gnostics were exterminated, their texts were uh, destroyed, and the only um, thing that we had for a long time about Gnostics were Christian writers saying how dreadful they were and explaining why. So they gave the Gnostic ideas from their own point of view with a lot of bias. Now we are more of Gnosticism, partly because after the Second World War, a, um, a find was made at Nakamadi in Egypt, which included a whole lot of Gnostic texts buried. And we could see that that, that Corpus Medica, which turned up in the Renaissance, was actually part of the body of the Gnostic texts. There were other people working along the same lines. They often called themselves major. A magus was somebody who knew a lot, but also somebody who could work magic. And among these Major, we should perhaps mention, apart from the Chino, uh, Cornelius Agrippa of Letterson. Cornelius Agrippa of Letterson. Now, it was very dangerous to, to do stuff with this because the church, once it got an idea of what was going on, the church got quite worried about it. And anybody who was pursuing these ideas was in danger of being called heretic and burnt. This happened indeed to Giovanni Bruno. So, some of them developed other strategies. Cornelius Agrippa, for example, wrote um, a book all about how to do magic, and at the same time, he wrote another book all about how magic was not happening. So, if anybody said, What do you believe? He could say, Oh, well, I believe it was a book of rubbish, or if the other person liked it, oh, actually, that's the one. We're never quite sure, we never know quite exactly how that worked, but it looks like. Then there was a man called uh, Abbot Trevenius, Abbot Trevenius, who uh, went around the back of and said that he could capture up visions of the emperor and so on. Um, and there was uh, Reichlin. Reichlin was very interesting because he talked about the miracle working word. On the surface, he said the miracle working word was Jesus. So it looked again like very conventional Christianity. But actually, if you read it very carefully, what he's saying is language is miracle working. The word in that sense is miracle working. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then there was Paracelsus. Paracelsus, uh, who listened to the stories of wise women about how certain plants could be used in medicine, in particular, according to whether they had a signature. In other words, if a plant looked like a part of the body that you wanted to cure, or looked like a particular disease, then it probably was. And that's how they made their first medicines. And interestingly enough, modern science often still uses exactly the same plants that Paracelsus developed. Paracelsus still has a very positive name uh, in Germany. In Germany, the, a lot of hospitals are called the Paracelsus. Um, so he again managed to escape the church, partly because he moved to Alice. Yeah. In uh, England, there was a man called Thomas Harriot, who was also uh, a magus. Thomas Harriot was in the circle of Sir Walter Raleigh. 
Uh, in fact, he instructed Fortunatus the captains in the seamanship. And he went with Raleigh's expedition to Roanoke, the first settlement, and he found native speakers of uh, American Indian language, and he actually um, noted down their language. Uh, I don't know how far he was able to learn it, but the problem was he noted down the language in, um, in uh, phonetic writing. He developed a phonetic writing rather like shorthand, and uh, people believed that these were seals. Seals were special signs that he used to call out devils. So he, he got a, a bit of skepticism there. But he was protected because he was with Sportabai. Now you may not know, of course, there's another person who was with Sportabai at the time, was Christopher Marlowe. So probably Christopher Marlowe got a lot of the ideas he was working on from Thomas Harriet. And um, he may even have got hold of this strange book that was doing the rounds in Germany called the Faust Book. The Faust Book, which had a lot of stories about somebody called Faust. And he may have got a translation of it before it came out in English because it came out a bit later. And the play, although it obviously quotes the Faust Book, is probably even earlier. Yeah. Um, the Faust book uh, is about Faust, and for a long time people thought there really was a Faust. But researchers have shown that everybody who is talking about the Faust has something funny about it. For example, uh, you write a letter to somebody and you say, Have you heard about Faust in your city? He's doing this, that, and the other. Why should you tell the person in the other city if he actually knows it already? Most of the things that were being written about Faust were distracting attention. They said things like, why doesn't the church worry about Faust instead of Weichdien? You should leave Weichdien on its own. Faust is the problem. Almost certainly didn't exist, Faust. But these stories did. So we get connections with Marlowe Circle and with Marlowe. And that finds its way into the play. Now, there's um, Gnosticism. Some, some people might ask, okay, what, what sort of texts are these Gnostic texts? <coughs> They're very interesting. Uh, one of them, for example, was taken up into by Thomas Mann in uh, Dr. Faustus' his novel in German. Um, it includes things like a completely different story of Adam <coughs> In that story, the creator of the world is actually not God, he just exists. He is what is called a demiurge. And he creates dark powers called Arcos. And they create a human being called Adam and take Eve out of Adam's body, just as in the Bible that we have. But um, the Arcos try to rape Eve. And he comes back in the form of a serpent, of a snake. Coming back from the true God, who is absent. True God is absent. Not the God who created In this world. And the snake persuades Eve to uh, eat the apple, or the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And Eve then persuades Adam to live the world to the And through that, they are able to liberate themselves from the golden cage. So here, Eve is the heroine of the story. She is the one who understands what you need to do to liberate yourself from that golden cage in which you are held by these dark powers and try to regain connection with true God, the absent God, for whom you have a spark of divinity in the sun. Now there was also a man called Simon Magus, roughly at the same time as Christ. We don't know very much about him. A man called CRS Mead, who later worked quite a lot uh, on uh, connections between this tradition and Indian traditions. 
Um, CRS me wrote about Sandra Davis. Uh, he apparently did miracles um, in what we now Palestine. And um, he uh, went around with a book of Helen. And he said this Helen was actually a uh, fallen femininity, and he had found her in a, uh, in a brothel as a prostitute. Uh, but she was the spirit of the divine fem uh, feminine. So he went out with her, and this became quite a famous story. Uh, and in one of the stories about Simon Magus, he calls himself uh, Fastus. Uh, he transforms into a different shape to escape something, and he calls himself Fastus. So interestingly, we get a direct connection back into Fastus. Okay, um, of course, then we also get um, Shakespeare, Prospero's Magic, and here. The point about Prospero's Magic is you should be very you should be very well, but it is. Prospero's Prospero's Magic is that he has to give it up. At the end of the day, he gives up magic. And by giving up magic, he also gives up Ariel. He frees Ariel. Um, and of course, some people would say, you can't interpret it like that, that Prospero is the theatre Prospero is doing theatre. There are a number of things that, that make that happen. The mask, for example, where the spirits uh, put on a play for a uh, round of um, And uh, the whole thing can be seen as a play. And at the end, those rather flat lines at the end of the play, rhymed lines, nothing like the rest of the play, with its magical language, is more or less saying, okay, that's the end of the play. Please clap because we're off. Um, so the theatre, the idea of the theatre. Cornelius Agrippa of Edison said that. It was important that the soul was standing and not free. Simon Mayus called himself the standing one. Standing and not falling. A group has said there are four poles, the mandala, uh, and the lower pole is that the body. And it's very difficult to stretch yourself out on those four poles without falling. So standing, not falling. And I've already said, Quaichin um, <coughs> talked about the miraculous wood. And of course, the tempest is full of the idea of a miraculous wood. That through words, you can do all sorts of things. Which, you know, look as a even the beginning, it's beautifully done. The beginning of the tempest is a really realistic story with all the nautical language and so on. And then, whoosh, off the stage, and Prospero says, You think this will be die in this world, but it didn't. Everybody is fine. In fact, he's quite annoyed with his daughter because his daughter says, Why are you going to be my son? And he says, Just shut up. He uses the word you instead of that, which is the way in which you express anger as well. Not the, the, the nice uh, now meaning, I love you, but you can shut up. Uh, he is sometimes quite a different character. And of course, in post colonial times, uh, everybody talks about Prospero as the colonizer, and Caroline as the colonized, and then they miss some of the subtleties. Like, if not careful. Then you get on to things like our oh, area that represents the police, and um, we get up to all sorts of over interpretations. I wasn't interested in that, I was interested in these very strange things. Okay, so Marlowe's Octopus, Shakespeare's The Tempest, seem to be related to that, what I call it, Gnostic Hermetic tradition. What happens after that? 
Well, Renaissance magic led to the Islamic investigating things. They wanted knowledge. This is what Gnosticism is all about. Gnosticism means knowledge. Not just we do what God says, and we do what the Bible says, and we do what the church says. They want to find out for us. So most of the major were also, if you like, for the scientists. I've explained about Paracelsus, but quite a lot of them were doing the experiments on matter, the experiments that were going to be eventually to what we call science. So we move from Renaissance magic to the Enlightenment. Um, the, the other thing in the Renaissance, in the magical tradition, was a science which has been around for a long time. It was around in India, it was around in China, it, it was around in Europe. It was the science of alchemy. Alchemy. The idea that you can change materials. The sort of uh, popular idea was you could change them into gold. But that's not what they were doing. It was a wonderful text in which um, the Arab king, Khaled, finds a, uh, an alchemist, a hermit alchemist in the desert called Morianus. And he brings Morianus to the court to explain to him what the hell are you doing? What is this alchemy stuff? And he says, well, what we're doing is we are converting the things which have left us into the philosopher's stone. Well, what's the philosopher's stone? The philosopher's stone has many, many, many names. Some people call it Jesus, some people call it gold, some people. If you call it gold, it's not gold. Dafa. They often said that. Or the philosopher's stone is the lapis. The thing that actually can be the transformation. Where do you find this lapis? Says Khan. Oh, you find the lapis in the shit. The lapis is in the shit. That's where you get it. And then you can transform things. So that is an extraordinary story. So this alchemy, almost all the people I mentioned were alchemists. They did alchemy. <coughs> Come back to our opinions. Now, um, sometime in the 17th century, that old cousin of all showed that the Corpus Hermeticum, which everybody had been saying was written maybe at the time of Moses, and was a really old text, and really important, it's a none of them, it's just it's a much newer text, it was written sometime in the second, third century, and showed that that was happening. And that meant that everybody said, oh, in that case, of course, in the medical is a fraud. You can forget about it. Uh, and it was about that. Of course, we now know as a Gnostic text, yes, that was when it was written, but they didn't sort of know about that, but they didn't publicize that. Instead, we moved from the major miracles to what we call the Enlightenment, the beginning of the Enlightenment. The idea that the rational mind is what is it. And here we should mention Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon said, don't bother about all that magical stuff. What we need is science. And with science, you can use nature, and he uses the gender, female. She will be your slave. We will make her our slaves. And that, of course, was the project in Europe from leading <coughs> into all the European dominance, which we see in colonials, but it's happening at the same time as we move into the Enlightenment. The Europeans are going out and trading and everywhere where there's a difficulty trading, they take over and they colonize it or they send people out because they have enough land and take the land somewhere else. The whole colonial tradition runs parallel with this enlightenment tradition. And the Gnostic Hermetic tradition, which had been underground because the church had suppressed it before the Renaissance, 
which goes up and up again. Anybody who does anything to do with it is regarded as pretty bad. Added to that, we've got two people, King Blood and Flood. Flood was a believer in the Old Testament, and he, for example, had the idea that everything must be exactly um, congruent, must be perfect, for example, perfect circles. Uh, and he drew wonderful pictures of the universe and how man fitted into the universe, which come out of the Gnostic Hermetic tradition. And then there's Ocampula, who says, oh, no, quite nice, but we've got Tico Brahe, and he's showing that the, the planets do not move in perfect circles. They don't really exist. Uh, so the flood says, no, it's not possible. It can't be not perfect. So I don't believe really, it. Of course, it's Kepler who says that. Kepler says, you can have all these ideas if you want them, but we must go with reality. We must come back to what is really scientifically true. Then we have another pair, and that is Newton and Blake. Newton and Blake. Newton is well known as the author of theories of gravitation. He invented the process of calculus. He was a very strange man. What for many years was not known and not accepted was that Newton wrote more than he did about science. When this was first discovered, they said this can't be true and suppressed the information. Then they said, oh yes, but that was after he had a nervous breakdown. No, it was before he had a nervous breakdown, at the same time as he was developing the theory of gravitation. He was the center of the network of people swapping alchemical texts at that time in the 17th century. And these alchemical texts were going around, like in Russia, the Samizdat publication. You know, if you wanted to read Sojenitsyn or something, you got a copy handwritten from somebody, you copied it out and passed it on. So it's exactly the same pattern with the alchemical texts. Not very many of them were actually printed. Most of them are in manuscript But they can be found in libraries and now on the internet. They have extraordinary imagery, very good. Blake didn't know that about Newton. What Blake saw was that Newton was just a scientist. And he said, may God us keep from single vision and Newton sleep. What did he mean by single vision? Well, single vision, he then set it out in the letter to Thomas Bass. He said that vision is of various things. There is single vision. Single vision is the world as we see it scientifically on the surface. Us sitting here in this room. That is single vision. Twofold vision is metaphor. That for everything we see, it could be something else. It could be represented in an image in another way. Metaphor. Threefold vision is adding what he calls Bula. Bula is the realm of feeling. We add feeling, we add emotions, very much now a subject that is being talked about a lot by the And the fourfold vision is the vision of God, if you like, the vision of the whole universe. Interestingly enough, I'm back again with that number four. You know, we have the group, fourfold vision, circle, four gated city, all of this, the fourfold vision. If you go to any Google monument, you see that four rows of paradise and four gates, every quaternity, which was found in the And so we get a difference between rationality. And romanticism, because Blake ushers in the romanticism that we get romantics in Britain, and perhaps more importantly, we get romantics in Germany. This is, this is the study that I did at the university, the 
the Romantics paper, which I found fascinating, to see what Romantics were doing. Because what they were doing was turning the world upside down, rejecting all authority, saying, we want to see it in a different way, regarding magic as important, that you have a magic key to make the world beautiful, all sorts of things like this. And it disappeared. Romanticism disappeared and ended up being in German Peter Meyer and Victoria Dollars and so on. That was an explosion of creativity which died down. I felt this very much as we can talk. You see, I'm a child in the 60s. In the 60s, it was exactly the same thing. Suddenly, all the old hierarchies, all the old stuff, all the old certainties were thrown out. The times there are changing. And we believe everything is possible. All you need is love, said the people. Or incredible string bands, you know what you could be. Now tell me, my friend, why you worry all the time what you should be. You know what you could be. Your ultimate potential from within yourself is all you need. You see what happened to that as well. Why does that sort of thing happen? Well, perhaps we can begin to see. In rediscoveries, at the end of the 19th century, these ideas were being rediscovered, these texts were being rediscovered. Quite a lot of the Gnostic texts were run through what is called Freemasonry. A whole lot of Freemasons, uh, a lot of them didn't know what they were talking about, or didn't know what they were doing, but the texts of, that are involved in Freemasonry, a lot of it is actually out of Gnostic. And one that I was interested in was Rudyard Kipling, of course, real connection here to Alpha, because he wrote uh, the story The Man Who Would Be King. And The Man Who Would Be King is all about Freemasonry. Uh, the Man Who Would Be King discovers a Freemason, a Freemason sign in what is known as Kapiristan, and now there is Nuristan, but there in 1969, very strange. That, um, but Kipling, uh, he's not sure about it. He, he knows he's done out something a bit dangerous, and he withdraws again. And he says, you shouldn't go down the road to Endor, the, to the witch of Endor. And, and, and he doesn't go, he doesn't pursue it. The person who does pursue it is Yeats. Yeats pursues it. In things like Rosa Arkemic, he pursues it. And he talks about the way in which you can get back to this tradition. But he makes it clear that he, there is a danger. Now, Yates was in uh, an organization called the Golden Dawn. And the Golden Dawn was using alchemical material and had the idea that you could do magic with it. And there was a confrontation between Yates and Aston Crowley. Alistair Crowley was using the same stuff, but Alistair Crowley was using it realistically, as though it was real. <coughs> so he, for example, went up to the top of the mountain with a uh, male friend of his, and they did what was called Dee Magic. That comes from the Magus of John Dee, who wrote How You Can Sound Devils. And they summoned the devil and it culminated in uh, Crowley sodomizing the young man. And we all know what happened to Crowley, he went basically bonkers. Um, because, in my opinion, he was trying to say that magic should be real, it should be done realistically. And it isn't. That is the sort of calling, not that. Coming back to the group. And the next pair I got is Pauli and Jung. Jung wrote a book called Psychology and Alchemy, and he said uh, the images that come in the dreams of a modern scientific man are exactly the same as these weird images that you get in the alchemical manuscripts, which he had studied. Uh, which he had studied. And um, funnily enough, the Scientific man he was talking about, who was dreams that he didn't say it in that book, but we now know, were the work of Plotty. 
work and how the, the quantum physicist who I mentioned in my last talk. Uh, because it was Pauli and Jung who developed these ideas of synchronicity. Just to quickly recap from last time, synchronicity is an a causal connecting principle. We have, on the one hand, the space-time continuum, we have indestructible energy, and we know that that's connected by causality, but he posits an underlying Synchronicity. They weren't always like yet uh, accidents. So I was thinking about what does this mean? What, what, what's going on here? I was also interested in the fact that all these works have something to do with the shore. Blake uh, write, writes about popular vision during the walk by the sea. Prospero is by the sea on the island. Even Faustus has that. He says, the seigneury of Emden shall be mine. Emden was being, um, was being uh, reclaimed from the sea. It was reclaimed land. And suddenly I remembered, again, some of you remember the last time I talked about Cecilia, and I remembered that they said a very old book song, Good Star Man, which includes the lines, Find me an acre of land between the salt water and the sea strand. Between the sea and the land, you've got to find an acre of land. And then you'll be a true lover. Okay? You can't, it doesn't exist. These things do not exist. So we're talking about something that exists and does not exist at the same time. My argument would be that we are talking about metaphor. Metaphor is all about things that exist and do not exist at the same time. It's all about synchronicity. Why should two completely different things have a connection with each other? Synchronicity. If we go on, um, I've been looking into diverse Deleuze and his ideas about repetition in play. Because, of course, in the play, as I said, the play does not exist. And yet it does. Play is and is not at the same time. If you watch two dogs having a play fight, how do they know it's play? How do they know that it's not a real fight? They seem to get the idea there is play which is and is not. So from there, I went into four post-colonial writers. One of them is Dimitas Adapaya. In Dimitas, he's an engineer. And the engineer uh, believes that emotion and stories are nonsense. It begins with a horse has fallen down the well, and uh, the engineer's niece, uh, he lets her down half naked onto the horse that she can attach ropes and he's going to assist with the pulleys and he says that is what you need. You need engineering skills, you need to know the mechanical advantage, you need to know the mechanical powers, and then you can do it. And I know what you want, you just want the story uh, once upon a time. So that's all. If somebody comes from the city to persuade him to come back and solve the problems of the city, and Hiritas uses him as a catalyst to see what happens if he puts uh, Danilo, the visitor, with his niece. And uh, because actually, of course, he has a hidden passion for her. And that gradually leads to a catastrophe, particularly when Lydia understands what's going on, and she, at the end of the first half, hangs us. In the second half, the, it becomes clear that there is a sea animal out of the rock, which is snow. And this, it represents the fact that that body, that hanging body, is living. He can't get down. There is no way that his mechanical powers will do it. And then the voice of Lydia comes to him 
and says what you need is the only way to hold time, the only way to, to, to get this sort of thing is a story. You have to start once upon a time, and then you put it in the center, and what? And then you put it in the end, forever after. And he has to create the story of the horse, the horse falling into the well, which is him. He is now the horse that is falling into the well, and he can't help himself. This is a powerful thing. Uh, oh, by the way, the story itself, that was um, uh, once upon a time. It's a funny thing, once upon a time. I believe in the Indian languages, you say that was, that was not. Certainly in Czech, you do. In Czech, bil nebil, that was, that was not. In other words, here is something that exists, but it doesn't exist. David Dabney's crystal clear. Yeah, David Dabney's disappearance is also about an engineer. He's also about somebody trying to hold back the sea. They're trying to build a seawall to protect the crumbling cliffs of England. And the engineer has come from Guyana, and he had a, a European mentor, but now he has become independent and he's come to England to solve England's problems. You know, they have quite a lot of post colonial tropes in that. Um, but it's all about how truth or the rational is entirely unstable. And of course, here we're dealing with deconstruction, we're dealing with Derrida, we're dealing with the fact that every language is not going to be not going to be close to reality. It's always slipping away. You're never going to quite be there. Everything disappears, and indeed. You can't hold back the sea, you have to be able to see the land, one of the reasons that I asked David in the first place. So, colonial and post colonial, uh, but he also writes back to Conrad, and of course, writing back is so central to all post colonialism. The very few post colonial works that do not, in some way, write back, because the old canon was what you used to be, uh, you used to be hit over the head. You can't do this, uh, other <coughs> Europeans can do it. Here's Shakespeare, here's Dickens, here's that. They're all much better than you are, you know. And of course, you can do it, you can do it better. But you take what it was and you change it. The very famous one, of course, King Reese, uh, with uh, White Sargasso Sea, where she takes Jane Eyre and tells the story of the Caribbean heiress, the man in the attic, and makes it. That story instead. And so the writing back here to Conrad's Art of Darkness, David did it quite a lot. You remember at the end of um, the journey where Marlowe, Marlow, interesting, yeah, Marlow, uh, Marlow finds Curtis, and there is a <coughs> animal figure. I'm, I'm going to bring here the, the, the Jungian term animal figure. An extraordinary woman who is almost a spectre in the jungle. She's black. And Curtis says, You've got to give the message to my intended, who is, who is in the city of Brussels, described as a separate city, white but dead. And so Mara goes to see the intended. It describes him in all how he brings the whole of the jungle in with him. The whole of the heart of darkness comes in with him. And the attendant said, Could you please tell me what his last words were? And Marlow lies, or does he lie? Because he says, His last words were your name. But we all know that the last words, very famously, were the horror in the horror. So, Interestingly enough, did he lie? Is her name the horror of the horror? <laughs> so this is another thing that we find in Hamdi. It's a disappearing muse. A disappearing muse. The idea of the muse is very important. What leads us on the muse? Helen in the Augustus. Ariel in the Tempest. Again and again, we get a muse, a 
feminine figure, which is a lure. It's the same as Lydia and Lydia. It's a lure. The soul standing up for you can't fall. The kids down there is training it. So, uh, the disappearing is on the ground of the village because the, the village is going to go out and see. It represents quite a lot of places in the world that the sea has encroached on the land. So, another of the themes we be looking at. The third of the um, post colonial topics, Bolkrat's <coughs> an amazing novel verse for Meros. How many Meros do? It's the most incredible thing. really is fantastic. Now, in you know, uh, Meros, there is again Helen, the Muse. The blue show is called the Helen of the Caribbean, the most important geographical feature of the blue show. Two big mountains called the Piton, and if you have a bit of imagination, of course, there's a female anatomy in there. By the way, I spent the night on that topic of Piton with the uh, Rastafarians who put me in the night down with a rocker and English solution. Uh, but the important thing is, Helen in the story in Homeros is being fought over by two missions, Achille and Hector. Of course, you can see it's the end. So he's writing that to the end. And at the same time, he's talking about how Britain and France fought over solution again and again. So all of these things are coming back in. But there's one thing that interested me most. Was, uh, there's a character called Philoctet. Philoctet has got a wound on his leg, and he says this wound was caused by a strange man. Um, it won't heal. Of course, that's also in all. And the person who heals the wound is called Mark Hillman. And Mark Hillman is known for doing what they are, you know, as a character of tragedy. So one day, uh, I had the opportunity of meeting Derek Walker in Aberdeen, and I gave Derek a lift back to his hospital in, in Warwick. Uh, and I, he said, you're giving me a lift back. And you've got a free question. You can ask the question. So I said, how does Mark Hillman heal the wound? Yeah, he said, that's the question. That's what I like. <laughs> So I try to answer it in the book. Um, it's connected with the fact that he saw a big ship, a tourist ship, a big white ship. And in those days, it was the coal steamer. And when it was in the harbor, uh, to recoal the, the, the steamer, the coal was carried up by hand by a whole lot of women carrying the coal on their hands. So you get these little black figures going up the side of the ship. And Mark Kilman sees the line of ants going up above it. And she follows the line of ants and she finds a plant. And the plant heals the wound. So what Volcat is doing is saying, if you follow the metaphor, if you follow those figures, if you see what they suffered, if you look at the whole history of slavery, if you see the connections across the Atlantic, that can heal the wound. Very interesting. But entirely magical, entirely metaphorical. So, with the trail of ants and the whole characters as a metaphor, we can begin to create regrowth and new life. So instead of the Caribbean just being the dumping ground of slaves and indentured laborers, um, for which uh, Michael famously said nothing good ever came, we actually get the most extraordinary growth and potential. And that is something that Walcott really does give us. Not only Walcott does I'm just choosing that one because he's the one. And finally, I call the last chapter Gift of Magus, and that's about my friend Wilson Harris. Wilson Harris began his writing career by writing a book called 
How does the Green Company describe a group of people going out on a boat into the interior of Guyana, the great rivers of Guyana? And the trouble is that what they don't know is that they're already dead. Not only that, but the narrator is at the same time the uh, colonizer who is trying to uh, exploit people, but also uh, somebody who feels it in quite a different way. And he is actually called Dun, interestingly enough, the of an E. So Dun goes up the river and gradually gets to the palace of the Peacock, which are the great waterfall. Um, you could see it as, as the catcher. Actually, falls uh, most of the time. <laughs> the whole thing then becomes something slightly different. Wilson Harris said, I went up into the rainforest and I started trying to describe the rainforest and it was all rubbish. So I had to develop a completely new language to do it. And of course, that's why some people find like Harris did it. Because his new language is entirely different. There's lots of it, but also it has also realistic elements. It uh, completely destabilizes time. Time uh, is quite different at uh, any given moment. One thing can easily become another through, through metaphor. Metaphor, you see, here is not this thing is like that thing, that is the real, this is just the description. No, it is a bridge, a middle, in which it is both. It is both at the same time. Right? And at the same time, that Everything and yeah. And he talked about um, in his novels, uh, brilliant series of novels, which include Ancient of the Gate, which is, is, uh, takes place in, in Britain, um, Carnival, which is in Georgetown, but also in Jonestown, which was prompted by that terrible event in the jungle of Lego. Which uh, Jim Jones and the People's Temple, uh, trying to set up a utopian community, uh, end up with everybody that murdered or committed suicide. Uh, very, very shocking. And of course, Paris uses it again in quite a different way. If you want to know the history of Jim Jones, don't read Paris, read the history of Jones first, and then Paris, and then you'll see what Paris is doing. Uh, and with some memory, that's his last. His last novels are a bit like Beethoven's late string quartets, or T.S. Eliot's four quartets, right? They are somehow so ethereal, so unexplored. Um, I'm always amazed at that. He talks about an infinite rehearsal in the cross cultural imagination. Nothing is finished, everybody is biased, every position. You need cross culturality in order to overcome those bias, those biases, but you also need an infinite rehearsal. You don't get to the back of the balls. It's always just a rehearsal. So, again, the ideas of Deleuze are very important in looking at this. Yeah. At one point in the book, I write this, and perhaps that's important here. My argument is that the engineer who manipulates the projection of the natural world, which he takes to be the only reality, is actually the projection. To gain power by extending his body and nervous system in an illusory concourse of space and time. If you've read Marshall and Bloom, we extend our bodies, we extend our faculties. That is what modern technology does, smartphones and the latest. Uh, is the direct heir of the Gnostic Hermetic Vegas, who, in the guise of Faust, was seduced into bargaining his soul away for the Mephistophelian lure in the political and material world. <coughs> that soul, however, the Helen of Faustus, of Simonius, of Lydia of Trinitas, is the perilous agent of, the, of his redemption, his heir. The Gnostics, some of them said, because of all this, we should give up the material world altogether. 
So we can say, for example, the Argentines uh, said, we will not have anything to do with the material world. No, what we got here is something different. It is using the material world because it is a lure to move on to something else. Best example I can think of is the eros of the troubadours. You remember the troubadours always had the lady. Sometimes it's misrepresented in as courtly love. It's not courtly love, it's erotic. It's erotic, but it is not fulfilling. That's something different. That's what they do. That, of course, is also another flowering of the Western magic tradition. So, if I may, I'll, I'll finish with one of my poems, which I have at the end of the book. And you perhaps see how that relates. Called Pegasus. Pegasus, the winged horse of the imagination. And also, of course, in Dimitros, is related to it, among others. There's nothing that doesn't suit you. Any mood, any costume, just flatters the sheen of your body, the grace and the soul, the secret touch of your home. You make a world in your image, beneath you my back, speeding over the, the stubble, and your mind to guide me, my wings take the air. Hooked to that mirror, I can't doubt the flight to the eye of the day. I can't see how my body is poised in your vision or the distance between my feet and the ground. Um, of course, that's also all about standing in love for you. Just the last point about for you, which I found fascinating. The word for, connected with the Latin word casus, Case. Wittgenstein said, Die Welt ist alles, was mit Fallen ist. The world is everything that is the case. Four. Why? There's a word, big world. The big world means to happen. As soon as it happens, as soon as it descends into reality, pure is That is when the soul falls and doesn't stand. You have to keep somehow up somewhere else to find that land between the water and the sea strand. Now that is a good thing, and I don't know if I found the answer to it, but I would say it is important. And of course, you will recognize that a lot of these ideas resonate with ideas that have been around in the Indian philosophy for very long time. Okay, uh, there's also one or two references in this book to people like that. Uh, right. Uh, that's all I want to say, thank you very much. But I would like, um, this is the book that I've just been talking about in the English language. I would like to present it to the English department. Um, <laughs>
and the last bill for the concise set, I don't want to say anything about the problem of the uh, so she is looking after the dogs. But perhaps another time, if there's another time, there won't be any. Thank you very much.